Okay, so this quick video is just going to reiterate some of the lessons from the article. You'll recognise the charts from the screenshots in that same article. There's two charts here side by side. On the left, I've got what I've called a default mix, which we're not going to vary. And then what we are going to do is change what I've called the alternative mix, which is the one on the right, so that we can compare the two if we make changes between, for example, different renewables and base load and flexible power generating sources. So if you look at the default, our starting point on the left, we're showing power up the y-axis, time, hours along the x-axis. So really that's our standard demand curve energy mix view. You'll see lots of charts plotted like that. And so we've got the demand curve in red through the day. And beneath that, we've got the different sources of supply which are meeting that demand. We've got what I've called a base load supply at the bottom, which is operating on a steady basis, the same output 24 hours, probably very high capacity factor, something like nuclear, for example. And as we talked about in the article, that's something for the purposes of this I'm regarding as, as fairly inflexible. It's either not very economic to turn it up and down as demand varies, or it's not technically feasible to turn it up and down very quickly as demand varies. The other type of inflexible resource we've got, which is helping to meet that demand, is a mixture in this case of wind and solar, just to represent two types of variable renewable power. The solar has a kind of standard appearance, it's higher in the middle of the day, there's obviously none overnight, the wind I've allowed to vary a bit more randomly during the day. But those two are essentially inflexible because they depend on the weather. We can't choose the weather in a way that suits our changing demand. And so above that, to make sure that we do meet that varying demand curve, we've got what I've called flexible generation. And that flexible generation can be a mix of a number of things. It could be gas generation, it could be hydro, it could include things like generation out of storage, it could include interconnectors. We could also conceptually think about it including things like demand response, which we'll mention elsewhere in the course. But whatever that's made up of, that green area is essentially energy sources that we can vary when we want to, filling the gap above energy sources, wind, solar and base load, which are much more inflexible. And you can see the red box above that default mix, the total energy demand, in other words, the total area under that red line is 407 gigawatt hours. And of that 407 gigawatt hours, it tells you below that those flexible sources are providing 182 gigawatt hours of that total. It's also showing you the maximum power demand of those flexible sources. In other words, that's the maximum width of the green bar due the, during the day. And we'll come back to the maximum ramp up and ramp down rates a bit later on. So starting from that point, what happens if we start to change things? So one thing we might want to change is we might want to build out more wind capacity. Let's say we treble the wind capacity in this particular system. So if I multiply my wind capacity by three, what that's going to do is it's going to increase the amount of energy generated from wind with the assumption that the chart on the right is modeling a day when there was exactly the same wind resource available as the chart on the left. So by trebling the capacity, we've also trebled the power output at any point in time. And over the day, we've trebled the energy output. That's already raised one issue, which is that you'll notice there are a couple of places in the early morning and late at night We've now got an area of green above the demand curve. That area of green is actually the area of blue that's gone above the demand curve. In other words, at those times of day, we've got too much wind. So those two green areas, which are marked as flexible, which are above the demand curve, are basically saying we need to be flexible now, not in generating more power, but actually in getting rid of it. We've got too much. We're generating more than there is demand. So flexibility here would include things like curtailment. Do we just tell the wind turbines to turn off because there's too much wind. It can include things like storage again. Do we store that excess energy in batteries overnight to release it during the day? Or can we move it somewhere else? Can, through an interconnector, can we sell that power into a different market, for example? 
The alternative, of course, would be to generate less of something else overnight at the times when the wind is blowing, which in this case would mean turning our base load off. But we're working on the assumption here that that's difficult to do or uneconomic to do. Our base load likes to chunter away at a nice steady rate. But of course we may not have the same amount of base load if we're building out more renewables. It may be reasonable to assume that we've turned off some of our base load anyway. After all, the point of the article was to ask the question as to whether we need base load at all. So maybe we've got half as much base load in our alternative mix than we have currently. Now obviously that just moves everything down. It means that we can fit in more of that extra wind generation and have less of a problem in terms of curtailment, storage requirements, interconnection, i.e. ways to move that excess power. We've still got a little bit in this case with that multiple of wind generation. Perhaps if we get rid of base load entirely, let's move that down to zero. So if we get rid of base load entirely, then we don't have a problem anymore with curtailment. So in that sense, we could argue that actually by getting rid of our inflexible base load, it's given us more room to fit more wind into the system. And if we compare those two days, you'll actually notice that the amount of energy being used from our flexible sources is, is fairly similar. It's 182 gigawatt hours on the left in the default mix. It's gone up slightly to 208 gigawatt hours on the right. Effectively, we've turned off our base load, but we've managed to replace the energy from that base load by producing a lot more of it from the wind. There are a couple of differences though. You'll notice that the amount of power from our flexible sources is larger. So on the left, the maximum amount of power we needed at any time of the day from flexible sources was 14.3 gigawatts, whereas on the right it's now gone up to 17.3 gigawatts. And visually, I think you can probably see that that's occurring now at about 11 a.m. where we've got no wind at all. And so the flexible generation is having to cover the loss of all the base load and it's not having any contribution from wind. So it kind of highlights the point that although the energy generation of our flexible sources may not have gone up dramatically, we do need more capacity. And of course, what if it isn't this particular day? What if we've still got the same level of demand, but there's not much wind? What if it's a still day? By clicking that, all I'm doing is reducing the output of the wind, in this case by 75%, to model a still day. Now without any base load and without additional wind energy to fill that gap, the flexible supplies are having to work harder. So the maximum power demand is now up to nearly 21 gigawatts and also they've got to generate a lot more energy. And that in a nutshell is going to be the challenge with turning off our base load. There might be days when we've got good wind resource where actually in energy terms we're not having to generate a lot more extra with uh, flexible resources but we might still need more of them because actually the power at any one point of time the power requirements are, could be higher at a point in time and particularly we have to bear in mind that there may be some still days and on still days our flexible resources will have to both cover the lost energy um, from the baseload that we've turned off and also have to cover the power requirements if the wind is not blowing very strongly. So in other words, if we're gonna turn base load off, yes, there'll be days when we can replace the energy loss through variable renewables, but for our system to be reliable, even on days when there's not much, in this case, wind, we're gonna to have to build or otherwise provide more flexible supplies. And there'll be some days when these flexible supplies are working very hard, and there'll be other days when they're not working so hard. So we'll like to have to come up with business models for those flexible supplies that still make economic sense in a market where their output is going to have to vary more often and by larger amounts. Basically filling in the gaps from our variable renewables. And there may be some technical restrictions on that in terms of how fast we can vary our flexible sources, but particularly there'll be economic issues around that. Can we justify the cost of building more flexible supplies? And also if they're turning them down more quickly, what does that do to the efficiency? we may end up burning more fuel to do the same amount of work in a system when we're turning up and down more often and more rapidly than in a system where our flexible supplies are operating with more gentle variations in work.
And that last point is what we can illustrate by looking at ramp rates. So on the left hand side, in our default mix down at the bottom, it tells us that the maximum ramp up rate is 2.5 gigawatts per hour. In other words, the maximum rate at which our flexible power demand changed over the course of that day was that one hour was 2.5 gigawatts higher than the previous one. And moving in the other direction, maximum ramp down rate during the course of the day shows that there was one particular hour of the day where the output of our flexible supplies was 3 gigawatts lower than it was the previous hour. Now if we go back to our alternative mix, the ramp up and down rates actually aren't dissimilar, but bear in mind we're talking about a day without much wind. If I go back to our windy day, what you'll notice is that because the wind is varying up and down by much larger amounts, the flexible resource is also going to have to vary up and down by much larger amounts to fill the gaps, and so those ramp rates up and down are larger. So again, it's just highlighting the fact you're going to have much more rapid changes in the way our flexible supply has to work, which might have impacts in terms of its efficiency, economics, and so on. And if you want, you can show where those different ramp rates occur during the day. Um, if I click on here, it will produce the dotted line showing ramp rates. If we compare the two pictures, they're broadly similar in pattern, but it's just that the scale and the the variability of that line on the right is much higher than on the left. And you can see that the highest ramp rates occur when the direction of change of wind is opposite to the direction of change of demand. So in the morning, for example, you can see that demand is going up, but wind is going down. And so what that means is that our flexible supplies are having to increase not just to cover the increase in demand, but also to cover the decrease in wind output. The reverse is true in the early evening, where demand is going down and wind is going up. Again, our flexible supplies have to reduce output, not just because demand is reducing, but also because the amount of wind is increasing. The impact of changes to our mix, in particular introducing variable sources variable inflexible sources into that mix and taking away base load also depends on how our inflexible sources are like to coincide with demand. So I've only looked at wind so far. What if I start increasing solar? Let's increase solar by three times as well. Now you'll notice that that's not really created too many problems. It's not certainly not created any extra curtailment. Um, the reason for that is because all the growth in solar is in the middle of the day when demand is fairly high anyway and as it happens wind is also relatively low and so by producing more solar energy we've now reduced the amount of energy that flexible supplies have to deliver during the day. It's down to 163 gigawatt hours on the right from 182 gigawatt hours on the left and we've actually also reduced the maximum power demand at any point during the day that we need from our flexible resources because that big gap between demand and supply at the point at about 11 a.m. when we had no wind is now being filled up with solar. And actually if I take that further and increase solar say to four times what it is now, it's still fitting without any problems beneath our demand curve. We've got no curtailment issues. We're reducing the amount of energy we need to generate from our flexible sources, which might be a good thing if that means burning less gas, for example. And we're not having a big impact on the amount of power demand from those flexible sources. Again, a big caveat, of course, what if it's a cloudy day? So if I build out all that solar capacity, but I have a cloudy day, it gets us back to the point where our flexible generating sources have to be prepared to generate a lot more on some days when it's cloudy, and also the power requirement on cloudy days is going to be higher. And also if we increase solar and wind by such large amounts without reducing baseload, or getting rid of baseload in this case, if I reduce baseload only by 50% rather than getting rid of it completely, you'll notice that now we've got curtailment issues possibly in the middle of the day when the sun is at its peak, as well as those overnight periods of excess power generation as well. If this is a country with lots of sun but not very good wind resource, I might not change the wind capacity and that curtailment issue starts to go away.
Again, that's because the time periods over which we're getting our maximum solar output are coinciding quite nicely with the time periods when we've got high demand. In fact, in this situation, if I didn't turn down my base load, it's going to be during the middle of the day that I potentially start to have issues with excess power, which I either have to curtail or store or whatever solution I come up with. So the upshot of all that is that you can play around with the charts, you can play around with different mixes, and yes, it is possible to get rid of base load without having a system that can't work. If you're going to get rid of base load and you're going to build more variable renewables, which by the nature you can't control whether they coincide or not with demand, then there's no point thinking you can do that without having a plan to increase and operate more variably a bunch of flexible sources of supply. And those flexible sources of supply could be other renewables which are more flexible, particularly biomass, but increasingly they're going to be things like storage, interconnection, along with demand side flexibility, so demand response, demand management, peak shaving, efficiency, and a whole bunch of other potential measures.